If you were to ask the question, what is the most influential non-religious book of all time, then a strong case could be made for a book called The Elements of Geometry by Euclid of Alexandria. The Elements was written in around 300 BC and it stood unchallenged as more or less the textbook of all mathematics for about 2,000 years. It's been published in more than a thousand different editions going all the way back to 1482. So if we look over here at this 1644 French edition, we can get a bit of a sense for what's in this book. So the first diagram here initially looks quite alarming in its complexity, but if we look a bit more closely, we see something which actually is familiar to early secondary school children around the world. There's a right angle triangle, and on the sides of this triangle, squares have been drawn. And the statement at the top says, if you add together the areas of the two small squares, you get exactly the same area as that of the large square. So this is Pythagoras' theorem. Even at the time of Euclid, Pythagoras' theorem had been known for several hundred years. People knew that this was true. But what Euclid is interested in is not just that it's true, but also why it's true. And so the answer to that question of why is what we find here in this kind of barely comprehensible string of lines next to the diagram. I'm not going to go through this line by line, but I would like to give a little bit of a sense of the style here. You can almost imagine Euclid trying to explain this um, to a slightly irritating toddler. So he starts his explanation, maybe saying something like, there's a triangle here and clearly its area is half of the area of this square. And the toddler might interrupt and say, why? Why is that true? Now Euclid's prepared for this because he's actually got earlier in his book, in statement number 41, a proof of that fact. And there's a little annotation in the margin pointing to that earlier statement. So you can say, well, look, I explained it there. The problem is the toddler could then respond, but why is that true? Fortunately, if we flick back to that proposition, um, we'll see that that one depends on some earlier, simpler statements, some simpler facts. And those, in turn, depend on simpler facts still, which the toddler would discover if they kept on asking why. But at some point, this kind of silliness has to stop. At some point, if the toddler asks, why is that true? Euclid will respond, look, it just is. You have to accept this, otherwise we can't have a conversation. This is an assumption we're going to agree on. And the thing that's amazing about the elements is that Euclid is incredibly clear about what these sort of foundational statements are, the foundation stones of the whole thing. He calls them axioms or postulates, and he lays them all out and then is incredibly careful explaining how everything else is built on top of them. And it's that logical structure that made the elements so influential, because it was seen not just as a book about maths, but almost as a book about reasoning itself, about logical argument. So it was almost the preeminent way to train your brain for argument of all kinds. So Abraham Lincoln, for example, considered a complete mastery of the first six books of Euclid to be a kind of prerequisite for his career as a lawyer. And it's said that he carried a copy of the elements with him throughout his life. So if we look at this 1591 edition of the elements, we can see Euclid setting out his postulates and his axioms right at the very beginning. They're at centre stage. And they're quite simple things. They're things like, if you have two points, you can draw exactly one line between those two points. And if you can't take that on trust, then you're going to find it really hard to make progress studying geometry. I'd now like to look at this 1673 pocket edition of Euclid. This is a rather less expensive volume than the large one we were looking at earlier, and it's the kind of thing that might have been owned by a student. In fact, there's more evidence of this because the front cover has these geometrical doodles on it. It's been scored away by someone with a pair of compasses. Um, and I'd like to focus in on a statement or a proposition kind of early in the book, which children are generally told quite early in primary school, although very often they don't spend quite so much time thinking about why it's true. And the fact is that in any triangle, the three angles add up to exactly 180 degrees. So this is proposition 32. But before he can prove Proposition 32, Euclid has to lay some groundwork. He has to build up on those foundation stones for a little bit. And the things he needs are some basic facts about parallel lines. In particular, if you have a pair of parallel lines that go on forever and don't meet, and a line that cuts across them, then these two blue angles, these corresponding angles, are always equal. And these two red alternate angles are also equal. 
So armed with this, Euclid can go to work on his diagram. He adds a parallel line that goes through the corner C of the triangle and is parallel to the side AB. And he extends the base BC outwards to E as well. Using the parallel lines, we can now see that these two blue angles here are equal and also that these two red angles are equal. But now if we look at the extended base of the triangle, we see that the three angles originally in the triangle, the blue, the red and the green, are exactly the same as these three angles, blue, red and green, which make up this straight line. So the angles in the original triangle must add up to the same as the angles on a straight line, which is exactly 180 degrees. And that's it. So that's why this fact is true. We don't need to take it on trust anymore. We understand exactly why, provided, of course, we're happy to accept Euclid's postulates and axioms. So that's all been quite abstract, which I think is exactly what Euclid would have enjoyed. But it's also worth mentioning that geometry is a subject which has got some amazing, important practical applications. Um, and there's a really striking reminder of that at the back of the French edition we started with. So after several hundred pages of kind of beautiful, pristine logic, there's an appendix on the rather more practical business of designing fortifications. Euclid himself might have been very pleased with the logical tower he's built on his logical foundation stones. Um, but it's clear from this rather remarkable diagram that some of the people who came after him were at least as interested in building real physical towers and worrying about where the best places to place their guns would be.